Hello, welcome to the Monday, February 10th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier came across an interesting Visual Basic script that he's talking about in a diary that he wrote this weekend. Now, what's sort of interesting about this script is that it incorporates a number of tricks to detect whether or not it's running inside a virtual environment or a sandbox. Now, none of these tricks are specifically new, but it's sort of neat to see them all in one single malicious script. For example, uh, this script checks whether or not the system it's running on only has one CPU core. Pretty much any real system, and I think you actually would have a hard time buying a physical system with only one CPU core. So running only one CPU core makes you suspicious. Same, having only one gigabyte of RAM or less than 60 gigabyte of hard disk space. But often uh, researchers, when they are running uh, malware in a virtual machine, in a sandbox, uh, they're assigning minimum resources to this sandbox to be able to run multiple experiments at the same time. And uh, typically from a performance point of view, that's not a problem, but uh, this particular malware will not run. It will also check for a number of common tools that researchers are using to collect information about the malware they're investigating, like for example, good old Ollie Debug and uh, similar tools. Uh, there's a whole list here uh, that uh, Xavier found in this particular uh, malware. And if you're running any of the software on your system, well, it will not run. Also the obfuscation technique uh, being employed by this particular malware to make the code uh, harder to read is kind of interesting. So whoever wrote this malware went through quite a bit of pain uh, to make sure that the malware is not being reversed. Now, Xavier, well, it didn't uh, block him, of course, uh, from uh, doing a pretty good job with this. Also looks like uh, VirusTotal is actually uh, doing a pretty good job with this particular sample with a score of 25 antivirus engines detecting uh, this particular sample out of the 57 total that VirusTotal is using. Now, and Binary Defense has an interesting blog about a version of the Emotet Trojan that apparently is spreading via Wi-Fi networks. Now, part of what's interesting about this is the binary where they found it in, which has the fairly obvious name warm.exe, has been around for about two years, but apparently Nobody has so far described this particular behavior of Emotet. And the way it works is once it infects a particular system, it's trying to use the Wi-Fi capability of that system to figure out what nearby Wi-Fi networks are available. And if these Wi-Fi networks are password protected with WPA2 or the like, then it uses passwords that it found on the infected system to try to brute force uh, the Wi-Fi. So let's say you somehow figured out your neighbor's Wi-Fi password and you occasionally use the neighbor's Wi-Fi network. You have the password for it on your system. This version of Emotet may be able to now log into the neighbor's Wi-Fi network and then spread to insecure systems on that network. Part of the reason that this behavior hasn't really been discovered yet so far, that this scenario isn't really all that common. Yes, we all usually are in the range of a large number of Wi-Fi networks, but often we don't really know the password or don't have the password for those networks on our system stored. Like your email password is not necessarily your neighbor's Wi-Fi password, for example. So the applicability of this particular feature may be somewhat limited, but nevertheless, uh, kind of an interesting little twist uh, to Emotet. And a couple of uh, follow-ups uh, to stories that I covered last week. Uh, first of all, I mentioned the buffer overflow in sudo via the PW feedback feature. There 
is an exploit available for uh, this particular vulnerability now and quite a bit more detail about how uh, to actually uh, use and uh, weaponize uh, this vulnerability. Uh, again, it's not very common for uh, the password feedback feature to actually be enabled. So probably not really such a huge deal. And I mentioned uh, last week about the high silicon or Xiangmei uh, DVR vulnerability. These are uh, these uh, IP based DVRs that listen on port 9530 and where it's fairly trivial to enable the Telnet daemon via uh, this port. Well, I also mentioned last week that census apparently was uh, doing some internet wide scans uh, for this vulnerability. At least that's what we saw in our honeypots. Uh, they now published a blog with the results and a bit more than 9,000, 9,362 hosts they found listening on this port. So, well, I wouldn't rate this as sort of a super big issue as a result. Taiwan and Vietnam are the top countries that are hosting vulnerable devices here, followed by Brazil and Turkey. Thanks for listening again today. This is also the 11th anniversary of this podcast. So, uh, well, why do I do it for so long? Because people are listening. If you have any suggestions, uh, please let me know. Please recommend it to your friends. Uh, leave some good feedback on various podcast sites or well, uh, just uh, post about it on social media. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.